Здравствуйте и добро пожаловать на лекцию 7 из серии «Лекция о международной торговле». В предыдущей лекции я рассматривал две функции коносамента, его функцию квитанции и его функцию в договоре о перевозке груза. Последняя функция и, возможно, наиболее уникальная функция коносамента заключается в его использовании в качестве товара распорядительного документа. Это значит, что передаточная надпись «Индосамент» и доставка коносамента считается доставкой товаров. Это было решено еще в 1787 году в деле «Лиг Берроу и Мейсон». Присяжные из купцов вынесли заключение в ответ на вопрос суда о том, что существует торговая традиция, в соответствии с которой передача коносамента рассматривается как передача груза, к которому он относится. Так что более 200 лет в английском общем праве передача коносамента считается передачей груза, к которому он относится. Я бы хотел прежде всего рассмотреть ситуацию с английскими юридическими обязательствами. Коносамент главным образом представляет право доставки товара держателю коносамента перевозчикам. Перевозчик обязан осуществлять доставку товаров держателю коносамента по прибытии в порт. В деле Сендерс, Бразерс и Маклин лорд судья Бауэн использовал красочные выражения для описания коносамента, который, по его словам, был ключом, который в руках законного владельца должен открыть дверь склада, постоянного или временного, в котором могут оказаться товары. В данном случае метафорой явно является коносамент как ключ к доступу к товарам на судне, когда оно прибудет в порт назначения. Не стоит недооценивать коммерческую значимость. Это значит, что пока товары находятся в пути, грузополучатель и грузоотправитель могут проводить с ними операции, индосируя коносамент. Это значит, что право требования доставки товаров с индосированным коносаментом допускает использование товаров, которое в противном случае было бы невозможно. Это свидетельствует о важной роли, которую документы, в частности коносамент, играют в международной торговле. Благодаря коносаменту возможна торговля товарами, реализация которых во время их транспортировки в противном случае была бы невозможна. Обязанности перевозчика по доставке товаров в конце пути требуют уточнения. Защита действует в обоих направлениях. Владелец судна имеет право отказаться от доставки, если только не будет коносамента. Он не обязан осуществлять доставку кому-либо, не имеющему коносамента. Однако судовладелец будет защищен, если осуществит доставку при наличии документа оригинала. Примером служит дело Глен Миллс и Карри в East India Dock, которая рассматривалась Палатой Лордов в 1882 году. В данном случае, по просьбе грузоотправителя, после отгрузки судовладелец подготовил три коносамента. Грузоотправитель передал и индосировал два из этих коносаментов индосату. Но грузоотправитель оставил один коносамент себе и нечестно воспользовался им для того, чтобы получить товары, когда они прибыли в порт назначения. Лицо, которому были индосированы другие коносаменты, предъявило иск владельцу судна 
о неправильной доставке товаров грузоотправителя. Палата лордов решила, что поскольку грузоотправитель представил оригинал коносамента, который не был передан, владелец судна имел защиту, так как в этой ситуации он имел право осуществить доставку товара. Палата лордов указала на то, что это было неизбежным следствием наличия нескольких коносаментов, и что это было сделано грузоотправителем, а не перевозчиком. Третье правило заключается в том, что перевозчик будет обязан возместить ущерб законному владельцу товаров в соответствии с коносаментом, если он осуществит поставку какому-либо еще, у кого нет юридически действительного коносамента, даже если перевозчик осуществит доставку правильно и без нанесения ущерба. Так что перевозчик обязан доставлять товар лишь держателю юридически действительного коносамента. Эта ситуация недавно рассматривалась в деле под названием «Мотис Экспортс». В данном случае судья Рикс рассматривал ситуацию, когда владелец судна осуществлял доставку товара по фальшивому коносаменту. Перевозчик не обвинялся в совершении ошибок или небрежности. Тем не менее, был сделан вывод о том, что неспособность осуществить доставку в соответствии с юридически действительным коносаментом возлагала ответственность на перевозчика перед грузополучателем за неправильную доставку и причинение ущерба, хотя в этом абсолютно не было вины владельца судна. Судья сказал, что если бы он вынес какое-либо другое решение, это бы разрушило сам принцип того, что коносамент является ключом для открытия временного склада. Цитируя упоминавшегося лорда судью Бауэна. Такова была первая причина. Вторая упоминавшаяся причина заключалась в том, что из двух лиц, держателя юридически действительного коносамента и перевозчика, именно перевозчик должен нести бремя обмана в подобном деле, так как перевозчик мог защититься от подобного обмана делая свои коносаменты более четкими. Поскольку именно перевозчик готовит коносаменты, он должен тщательно проверить, является ли представленный коносамент подготовленным им коносаментом. Мы можем поспорить с судьей по этому вопросу, так как коносаменты готовятся в стандартной форме, и можно поставить под сомнение идею о том, что каждый коносамент является уникальным или может отличаться от других. Добавьте сюда еще и тот факт, что благодаря современной технологии печати изготовить убедительные копии бумажных документов довольно легко. Now, 
exports. Consider the question, well, why exactly is it that the ship owner issues a bill of lading which is transferable? We could say that the ship owner, carrier, might well prefer to issue a document which was not transferable. If he was to issue a document which was not transferable, there would be no danger at all of there being an eventual forgery of this kind, because the consignee, the intended recipient of the goods, would be known and certain from the very beginning of the voyage. As we'll see in a moment, in fact, in international trade today, it is fairly common for non-transferable documents to be issued by the carrier in place of the Bill of Lading. In essence, then, it is the shippers, the people who own the goods, who demand this idea that there be a transferable Bill of Lading, because this gives them the benefit of dealing with the goods while they are at sea. But we could say that Having this idea of a transferable document has an inevitable risk of fraud. And if it is for the shipper's benefit that this practice is being adopted, then we could say that it's the shipper who should bear the risk of fraud. So, to reiterate, this recent case in 1999 has affirmed very strictly the rule that the carrier should only deliver against the real true bill of lading, and that he is strictly liable, that is, liable without fault, even in the case of a forged bill of lading. Now, the second aspect of this same case, Motis Exports, went to the Court of Appeal, and this was on a clause in the bill of lading which I will read out to you. Clause 5.3 said, where the carriage called for commences at the port of loading and or finishes at the port of discharge, the carrier shall have no liability whatever for any loss or damage to the goods before loading or after discharge over the ship's rail, however caused. So, in summary there, this exemption clause in the Bill of Lading was saying that the carrier had no responsibility for any damage after they had left his possession however caused. Now, the argument for the carrier was that the damage that had been caused was the fraudster taking away the goods after they had been discharged from the ship, and that that was covered by this exemption clause because this was damage which occurred after they had left the carrier's custody. Now, the Court of Appeal rejected that argument. The Court of Appeal adopted the rule that any exemption clause in a contract is to be construed strictly against the person trying to rely upon it. So this is the contra proferentem rule of contractual construction, which applies to any exemption clause. And that will be familiar to you from the contract law and practice aspect of this course on English law. Now, this, again, with respect to the Court of Appeal, may be criticised because, presumably, the Court would have to admit that if the goods were being carried from the ship to the port on a lighter and that lighter was to sink and the goods were lost on the bottom of the seabed, well, then this clause that I've read out to you would indeed cover that loss and the carrier would not be liable. Therefore, we can ask, well, what is really the difference? here. It's as if the goods have been stolen by the fraudster. And why should it make any difference whether the goods are lost, that is, lost by the intended consignee, whether they are lost by an accident which sends them to the bottom of the seabed, or whether by a deliberate fraud which simply takes them into the hands of a thief. There seems to be no obvious difference between the two. And in a comment in the Lloyd's Maritime and Commercial Law Quarterly. Mr Brian Davenport QC has commented that one is forced to say that there is a fundamental obligation to deliver and that by some legal magic the exception clause does not apply when it would otherwise apply. He goes on to mention that 
This comes perilously close to, if not actually to be, the doctrine of fundamental breach, notwithstanding the fact that that doctrine was disapproved by the House of Lords in Photo Productions and Securical Limited in 1979. Now what Mr Danforth is suggesting in his note there is that the Court of Appeal is adopting a rule of law that it is never possible to have an exception clause which exempts the carrier from liability for delivering to a fraudulent possessor of a forged bill of lading. What the House of Lords in the photo productions case said, as you will recall, is that it is not possible to have rules like this which stop parties from inserting particular clauses into their contracts. Because, the House said, that would be inconsistent with the idea of freedom of contract. If the shipper and the carrier agree that the carrier should not have liability for, or at least not have strict liability for delivering the goods against a forged bill of lading, then the ideology of freedom of contract says that the court should enforce that freely made bargain between the parties. So, this recent case of Motus Exports has taken a very strict view of the carrier's obligation only to deliver to the proper holding of the bill of lading, both in the initial terms of the decision, at first instance by Mr Justice Ricks, but also with the construction of the exemption clause in the bill of lading, that's to say the contract of carriage, by the Court of Appeal. Now, it will be obvious that there is a serious conflict of interests here. It may well be in the shipper's interest to have a transferable bill of lading because this enables him to deal with the goods while they are at sea. But equally, as we have seen, this can pose serious problems for the ship owner, the carrier. Not only in the case of fraud, as in the case that I have just discussed, but also in the situation where the goods arrive before the bill of lading. Now, that might sound paradoxical. If the whole point of the bill of lading is to enable dealing with goods while they are at sea, then surely the point is that the bill of lading is more rapidly transferable. Well, that's not always true in practice. What is true is that in the modern world, as ships become faster, certainly since the age of sail power, ships have become a good deal faster, goods tend to arrive at their ports of destination rather earlier than they would have done at one time. At the same time, though, bills of lading still take a long time, often, to move from the hands of the shipper to the hands of the ultimate consignee, or if we talk in terms of the underlying contract of sale. The bill of lading takes a long time to move from the hands of the seller to the hands of the buyer. That is because the issue of a bill of lading is quite a complicated administrative task. The offices of the carrier will have to check against the mate's receipt, the goods received, enter this onto the bill of lading, check the terms of the contract of carriage, check that the right bill of lading is being issued and so forth. And that may take a significant amount of time. A second problem, as we, saw, we, as we shall see further in the final lecture, is that under the commonly used system of payments, the documents will in fact pass through the hands of a number of banks before they reach the ultimate consignee. In the system of documentary credits, which I shall be examining in the next lecture, the documents will pass through the hands of two separate banks in separate countries before the buyer of the goods obtains the bill of lading. So for all of these reasons, goods travelling faster, bill of, bills of lading travelling somewhat slowly through a complicated system of administration. It can often happen that the ship arrives before the bill of lading does. Now, if that happens, the master of the ship is in a difficult situation because, as I've explained, he will be strictly liable if he delivers 
to the wrong person. Now, it could be that what he should do here is to obtain instructions from the court as to what should happen, particularly in the situation perhaps where the bill of lading has become lost altogether. In practice, though, what will tend to happen is that if the goods arrive before the bill of lading, but there is somebody there to collect the goods who claims to be the person entitled to them, the ship owner will deliver over to them the goods on condition that they grant an indemnity to him should they turn out not to be entitled to the goods. So there will be a contract that on the one hand the carrier will render up delivery of the goods to this other person and that person will promise to first of all to give up to the carrier the bill of lading when it arrives but also to indemnify the carrier in case he incurs any liability to a true owner because of the wrongful delivery. So again this idea of an indemnity in the situation of certain amount of doubt if a party is acting in good faith but may incur liabilities on the basis of his actions, then he will demand an indemnity from the person who persuades him to act in that way. Providing that everyone or the carrier is acting in good faith, there is no reason why he should not be able to enforce such an indemnity. Of course, if he is colluding in a fraud, then we know from the case of Brown, Jenkinson and Percy Dalton that he will not be able to enforce it because it will be an illegal contract. A further practical problem with this idea of the carrier receiving an indemnity when he delivers before the bill of lading arrives is that the indemnity may in fact turn out to be worthless. The person to whom he delivers the goods may sell them and become insolvent. Alternatively, may even be acting in bad faith and run off. How this is solved in practice is that the carrier will normally insist that the indemnity is guaranteed by a bank or some other reputable source of credit before he will deliver the goods. So normally, in fact, there will be an indemnity backed by a guarantee from the deliveries bank. Now, one way of solving this problem altogether is, as I have mentioned earlier, not to issue a bill of lading at all, but rather to have a non-transferable sort of receipt for the goods. The most common one is known as the C way bill, or to be more full, the non-negotiable C way bill. Now, a C way bill is not transferable. The C way bill will name, at the time of shipment, the consignee and it cannot be transferred. So from the very beginning of the voyage, the carrier will know to whom he should make delivery. And there is no problem that he may, as with a bit of lading, that he may have to deliver to some person totally unknown who is a later transferee of the bill of lading. Now, sea way bills are in fact becoming increasingly common in practice. Some 85% apparently of transatlantic shipping takes place using waybills rather than a transferable bill of lading. Also, we can notice that this is acceptable to banks under the uniform customs and practice for documented credits that I shall discuss more later on. It is said that banks will accept a C waybill as one of the documents which make up the documentary credit. Why this is more secure for carrier or more secure for everyone in fact, is that the consignee does not need to produce the document. Therefore, there is no problem of the goods arriving before the documents. The consignee does not need to produce the way bill. All that he needs to do is to prove his identity. So, if we know that the goods are bound for X and Y limited, then all the carrier has to ascertain is that it is indeed the, the agent of X and Y limited who is receiving the goods from him at the port of destination. So, a non-negotiable way bill avoids this problem of the goods arriving before the documents. Where this is less satisfactory, though, is where the shipper wishes to deal with the goods while they are in transit. If the shipper wishes to deal with the goods while in transit, 
And after all, that provides the most um, flexible form of shipping, of carrying goods by sea. Then he will not want a way bill. He will insist on the ordinary bill of lading, which will allow him to deal with the goods while they are at sea. A final point to notice about the increasing acceptability of waybills is that they are now covered by the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1992. So the consignee under a waybill will have the rights against the carrier just as if he had been an endorsee of a bill of lading. So the 1992 Act represents an extension of the Bills of Lading Act 1855 because that Act as its title would suggest, applied only to bills of lading and not to sea waybills. That concludes the discussion of bills of lading. I'd now like to talk finally about the obligations of the carrier and of the shipper under the contract of carriage. Now, at common law, in fact, there was not necessarily a contract between a carrier and the owner of the goods being carried. Common law imposed upon one carrying goods, whether by sea or land, the status of a so-called common carrier. And the common carrier essentially had a strict liability to look after the goods. It was a strict li liability with certain limited exceptions those exceptions being act of God, act of the Queen's enemies, inherent vice of the goods, and a general average sacrifice. I'll come back to explain what those mean later on in this lecture. But for the time being, what should be noticed is that at common law, any carrier of goods had a strict liability, so a no-fault liability. If the goods were damaged or lost, whether or not this was through their fault, they would be liable to the owner of the goods unless they could bring themselves within one of those limited exceptions. In practice, however, at least by the 19th century, it was very rare for goods to be carried without such a contract. And the ideology of freedom of contract, which I made reference to earlier on, allowed parties to make a contract on any terms. What this meant in practice was that the ship owners, who were more economically powerful, would use the contracts of carriage to exclude their strict common law liability. In fact, ship owners were so powerful that they were able to exclude pretty much any of their liabilities to the owners of the goods, to the shippers. Now, by the early 20th century, this led to a good deal of dissatisfaction and international conventions were held in which attempts were made to curb the power of the ship owners, of the carriers, and to give more protection for the owners of goods, the shippers. Now, this conference led finally to the Hague Rules of 1924. The Hague Rules were the first international convention designed to protect the interests of the shippers against the carriers, the ship owners. Now that Hague Rules of 1924 was amended in 1968 and because of the place of amendment these revised rules are known as the Hague-Visby Rules. So the Hague-Visby Rules came into force in 1968. These rules are currently in force in the United Kingdom by courtesy of the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1971. So the United Kingdom has implemented this international convention, the hague Visby Rules, and they will apply to any international contract of carriage where there is a bill of lading. We can notice here that in fact sea way bills are not covered by the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1971. So in a contract of carriage which is not contained in a bill of lading, the hague Visby rules will have application only if the parties themselves have stated in the contract that the hague Visby rules are to apply. Now, the hague Visby rules, as I have foreshadowed, make sure that carriers have certain 
minimum obligations to the shippers. In fact, in the last lecture we saw an example of this, the duty to issue a shipped bill of lading containing certain information is imposed upon carriers by the hate bisbee rules. Now, an extremely important part of the hate bisbee rules is found in Article 3, Rule 8 of the rules. And this says that any term of a contract of carriage which purports to exclude the duties imposed by the hague Visby rules is to be void. So, it is not possible to further restrict the duties as laid out in the hague Visby rules. Any attempt to do that will be void. So, in other words, the hague Visby rules provide a certain irreducible core set of obligations for both the carrier and the shipper in a carriage of goods by sea situation. Well, first of all, let's consider the carrier's responsibilities. Well, the first and most important of these is the carrier's duty to provide a seaworthy ship. Now, this is um, Article 3, Rule 1 of the Hayek visby Rules. Now, this is not in fact, a strict obligation, as it was at common law, but is an obligation of due diligence, as the rules say. So there is an obligation of due diligence to make sure the ship is seaworthy. That means that the carrier has to take reasonable care. It has been decided, however, that even if the carrier himself has been careful, he will be liable if agents or contractors employed by him were themselves negligent. Um, so this is the case of the Muncaster Castle, reported 1961, Volume 1 of the Lloyd's Reports. In that case, the ship owner had delegated maintenance work to a reputable firm of contractors. So the ship owners personally had been careful, taken all reasonable care, but that apparently reputable firm turned out to do the work negligently, and the ship was unseaworthy as a result. The court, however, found the ship owners liable because the duty of due diligence was said to be a non-delegable duty. It was not possible to delegate that duty to other people, even apparently careful contractors. Now, what exactly do we mean by seaworthiness? Well, that means seaworthy both for the particular voyage which is to be undertaken but also for the cargo which is to be carried. Seaworthiness, it should be noticed, includes the equipment of the ship and the crew of the ship. So it's not simply the hull of the vessel itself. A final thing to notice is that the duty of seaworthiness applies only at the start of the voyage. A ship which becomes non-seaworthy later on in the voyage, perhaps as a result of some inherent defect or some accident, will not result in a breach of the hague Visby rules. So the time for assessing the seaworthiness of the vessel is the time of shipment, the time when the transit starts. Another thing which can be mentioned here is that the term of seaworthiness is an innominate term in the classification used by English law into conditions, warranties and innominate terms. It will be remembered that in fact the leading case on innominate terms, the Hong Kong fur case in the 1960s, was indeed to do with the term of providing a seaworthy ship. So it's only when the seaworthiness, the, the unseaworthiness is particularly serious that the shipper or the charterer will be entitled to reject the ship. The rules provide a separate duty to take care of the cargo. This is Article 3, Rule 2 of the rules, which says that the carrier has a duty to handle and keep the goods delivered properly and carefully. 
And that is to say, he must take reasonable care and he must keep them in accordance with a sound system in the light of his knowledge of the goods. Now, another obligation, this time one implied by common law, is that there must be a reasonable dispatch on the part of the carrier. What that means is that the voyage has to be reasonably speedy and the ship must arrive at the port of destination within a reasonable time. Now, it can be noticed that even if there is a delay, and perhaps a significant delay, providing the ship owner has acted carefully and non-negligently, he will not be in breach of that term. And we see that in the case of Hick and Raymond, 1893 appeal cases page 22. So the duty of reasonable dispatch is, it must be emphasised, again a duty of care rather than a strict duty. Now a related obligation is the carrier's obligation to proceed on the voyage according to the agreed route. To put that another way, the carrier has a duty not to deviate from the agreed route. That was a duty of common law, but um, also under the hate Fisby rules, Article 4, Rule 4. Now, the question is, what exactly is the agreed route? Well, a case called Reardon Smith Line and Black Sea Insurance, 1939 appeal cases at page 562. The House of Lords defines the, geograph the um, agreed route in the following way. Well, first, and obviously, is the route actually expressly designated in the contract. So if the contract actually states expressly the route which must be followed, then that is the one which governs this question. In the absence of such an express statement, then the agreed route will be taken to be the customary route between the two ports. So if there is a route customary in maritime circles for navigating between two points, then that route will be taken to be the one which the carrier is obliged to follow. Finally, however, in the absence of any other evidence, that customary route will be taken to be the direct geographical route. So the three possibilities in descending order are first of all an express obligation in the contract, secondly a customary trade route, or thirdly the direct geographical route. Now, there are certain agreed deviations which can be allowed. Now, at common law, these justifiable deviations were of two varieties. The first was a deviation from the agreed course to save human life was a justified deviation. Secondly, was the fact that the deviation was necessary to avoid danger to ship or to the cargo. So when the vessel itself or the cargo was in danger, it was possible to deviate from the agreed route. And indeed, it has even been held that that was so when the reason for the danger to the ship was in fact its own unseaworthiness. That was the case of Kish and Taylor. And that decision seems with respect to be very sensible. If the ship is leaking and is likely to sink, then it would seem rather strange if the ship owner was in breach of contract for going into port and attempting to stop the ship from sinking with emergency repairs. Now, the hague Visby rules add further justified deviations to the two common law categories. Now, the first is saving property at sea. So at common law, only saving human life was a justifiable deviation. The Hague Wisby rules add the saving of property at sea. And finally, the Hague Wisby rules add a rather open-ended exception, and that is any other reasonable diversion is a justifiable one. Now, as it so often happens, this idea of what is a reasonable diversion is a question of fact. However, the English courts have tended to view that final exception very narrowly, and in practice it is the saving human life, saving the ship and saving property 
which will be exhaustive of justifiable deviations. Another thing to notice is that a deviation is only a breach of this term if it is a deliberate act on the part of the master of the ship. So a ship which is blown off course does not, in the relevant sense, deviate from the agreed route. So it has to be a conscious decision to deviate if there is to be a breach of this term. If there is a breach of the duty to follow the agreed route, this is treated as a repudiatory breach of contract by the carrier. That is to say, the contract comes to an end and the carrier loses the protection from liability which he would otherwise have had under the contract. What this means then is that there is no contract and the carrier reverts to the position of the carrier at common law, the common carrier. You will recall that the common carrier had strict duties to preserve the goods, subject to the four narrow common law exceptions. Indeed, in one case it was held that the common carrier could not rely even on those exceptions if the reason why the loss to the goods had come about could be traced to the deviation itself. Now this is the, this is the case of Morrison and Shaw Smith which was decided in 1916 in volume 2 of the King's Bench Reports. Now in that case the carrier had deviated from the agreed route and while he had deviated, the ship was actually sunk by an enemy submarine which torpedoed it. So the carrier, this was the time of the First World War of course, now the carrier attempted to rely on the common law exception that acts of the Queen's enemies were an exemption for the common carrier's liability. But the court held that because he had deviated from the route, and it was that deviation which seemed to have caused this torpedoing by the enemy submarine that he could not rely on even the common law exceptions. Now, a further possibility here is that the terms of the contract may give the carrier liberty to deviate from the agreed route. And indeed, this is commonly called a liberty clause in the contract of carriage. Now, the general rule here is that, as with the exemption clauses, as I discussed earlier on, a liberty clause is construed contra proferentem, against the person seeking to rely upon it, or in other words, against the carrier in this case. The leading case is that of Glynn and Margotson, 1893 appeal cases, page 351. Now, in that case, в другом деле было необходимо отгрузить апельсины в Малаге и доставить их в Ливерпуль. Согласно договору, как указывалось в Коносаменте, судно могло входить в любой порт или порты в любом порядке. Судно отправилось в длинный путь и по пути заходило в различные порты. Это заняло много времени, и к этому времени, когда оно пришло в Ливерпуль, апельсины испортились из-за срока доставки. Палата лордов дала очень узкое толкование условию о свободном курсе и сказала, что судно имело право заходить в порты лишь на пути из Малаги в Ливерпуль. Так что, несмотря на то, что в договоре было сказано, что судно могло заходить в любой порт, в любом порядке, это было истолковано как использование лишь портов по маршруту судна. Таковы обязанности перевозчика в соответствии с правилами Хейг Бигсби и общим правом. Какие существуют исключения? Во-первых, у нас есть четыре исключения в общем праве. Во-первых, обстоятельства непреодолимой силы. Это несчастный случай, который вызван исключительно естественными причинами. 
и которого невозможно избежать, проявляя разумную осторожность. Поэтому в одном случае, когда судно врезалось в скалы в густом тумане, это не было обстоятельством непреодолимой силы, так как люди участвовали в управлении судном. Это дело Лайва Алкали и Джонсон, отчет о казначейство, страница 338, 1874 год. Так что обстоятельство непреодолимой силы не должно быть связано с вмешательством людей. Мы должны также отметить, что подобных вещей нельзя избежать, даже проявляя разумную осторожность. Например, если бы трубы на корабле замерзли, и их прорвало в сильный мороз, это не было бы обстоятельством непреодолимой силы, так как можно было бы предположить, что холодная погода предполагает необходимость изоляции труб. Второе исключение – это действие врагов королевы, то есть врагов во время войны. В деле South Cots, рассмотренном еще в 1601 году, было дано соответствующее объяснение. Если агенты врага несли ответственность за потерю или ущерб, перевозчик не мог получить возмещение ущерба. В обычных условиях перевозчик мог бы получить компенсацию от третьих лиц за свою ответственность перед владельцем товаров. В деле Саутскотс было показано, что в военное время нет даже теоретической возможности предъявления иска таким людям. Третье исключение – это неотъемлемый дефект товаров. В данном случае слово «вайс» – зло, не имеет своего обычного значения, но означает, что недостаток товаров является фактором, из-за которого их качество может ухудшиться. Можно привести много примеров. Металл может заржаветь, фрукты могут созреть и сгнить, зерно может перегреться и начать портиться. Так что в случае, когда товары и их упаковка не могут предотвратить ухудшение качества товара во время перевозки, перевозчик ответственности нести не будет. Последнее исключение – это когда необходим вклад в общую аварию. Но я вернусь к этому вопросу, когда буду говорить об обязанности перевозчика, связанной со вкладом в общую аварию. Правила Хейк-Бигсби включают в себя длинный список исключений, освобождающих от ответственности. И они оговариваются в статье 4 правила 2 этих правил. Первое, что необходимо отметить, эти правила не применяются тогда, когда судно было негодным для плавания. Так что если перевозчик не смог предоставить подходящего судна, он не может использовать эти исключения. Давайте рассмотрим несколько других случаев. Ненадлежащее управление экипажем и навигация. Перевозчик не несет ответственности за нанесение ущерба товару, если это вызвано управлением судно экипажем или навигацией. Это условие подвергалось критике как слишком широкое. Если в обязанности судовладельца входит обеспечение судна, годного для плавания, и экипажа, было бы неправильно, если бы он мог избежать ответственности, обвинив экипаж. Кроме того, перевозчик 
не несет ответственности за пожар, если только это не его личная вина. Следующее исключение – морские риски. Это также неожиданные и неизбежные события. Но для того, чтобы они были морскими, необходимо, чтобы они произошли на море. Большие волны, столкновение с другими судами или портовыми стенами – все это морские риски так как они могут иметь место только на море. Однако ущерб, причиненный молнией, туманом, морозом, не входит в эту группу, так как все это могло произойти и на суше. Любое судно, годное для плавания, должно быть в состоянии вынести обычное действие ветра и волн, поэтому они не будут считаться исключительными событиями. Следующая группа – форс-мажорные обстоятельства, о которых мы уже говорили. Кроме того, существуют военные действия, похожие на действия врагов королевы. Кроме того, существуют действия социально опасных элементов, что обычно обозначает пиратов. Следующее исключение – это так называемое «restraint of princes», что означает действие официального правительства, причиняющее ущерб судну. В качестве примера можно привести арест судна в порту по любой причине, такой как, например, торговая эмбарго, наложенная на соответствующую страну. И эти действия в конечном итоге причиняют ущерб судну. Следующее исключение – это карантинные ограничения, что говорит само за себя. Затем идут упущения самого грузоперевозчика. Так что если виноват сам грузоотправитель, владелец груза, тогда перевозчик избежит ответственности. Затем идут забастовки, локауты и прекращение работы по любой причине, политической или общей. Это означает определенные конфликты в промышленности под руководством профсоюзов, ведущие к повреждению груза. Затем идут учиненные беспорядки и народные волнения, что очевидно. Затем идут спасение жизни или собственности на море, что также понятно. Затем идет неотъемлемый дефект, такой же, как в общем праве. Параграф П оговаривает скрытые недостатки, которые невозможно выявить при серьезном осмотре. Затем могут быть любые другие причины, не являющиеся виной перевозчика, его работников или агентов. В нормальной ситуации исключение должно соответствовать более ранним исключениям, но это невозможно в данном случае, так как более ранние исключения настолько разнообразны, что любая другая причина в данном случае должна приниматься в качестве новой причины. Но не забудьте о том, что грузоперевозчик должен доказать, что он не был виноват. Так что бремя возлагается на перевозчика. И это верно для всех этих исключений. Так что, когда выявляется нарушение, именно перевозчик должен продемонстрировать одно из этих исключений, и доказать, что он действовал разумно.
Угрозу отправителя также есть определенные обязанности в соответствии с договором о перевозке. Одна из его обязанностей заключается в том, что он не должен отправлять опасные товары без уведомления перевозчика. Если перевозчик знает о внутренней опасности, считается, что он принимает этот риск. Взрывчатые вещества, например, означают, что он знает об опасности. Опасное означает, что это опасно для судна, для другого груза. Но это также означает незаконный груз, который мог бы привести к наложению ареста на судно. Так что перевозка груза, которая привела бы к аресту судна в любой стране, в которой оно могло бы зайти, также считается опасным грузом. Лорд Мастил, лорд судья, рассматривающий дела из коммерческих споров, предпочитает говорить об опасных ситуациях, связанных с грузом, а не об опасных товарах. Эта обязанность существует в общем праве, и в соответствии со статьей 4, правилом 6. Недавно Палате Лордов пришлось рассмотреть проблему стандарта ответственности и определить, лежала ли в ее в основе вина, или это была строгая ответственность. В деле The Giannis N.K. 1998 год, том 1, английские отчеты, страница 495, был сделан вывод о том, что это строгая ответственность. Они подтвердили, что это верно, как в общем праве, так и в соответствии с правилами Хейк Бигсби. Перевозчик не обязан демонстрировать наличие вины, но должен лишь показать, что грузоотправитель отправил опасные товары, не уведомляя об их опасном характере. Вторая обязанность грузоотправителя заключается во вкладе в общую аварию. Это очень старый принцип, идущий из Гражданского кодекса Родеса, через римское право. Это ситуация, когда судно или груз находятся в опасности и приходится жертвовать определенными частями груза для спасения рейса. Например, судно застревает на песчаной мели, и груз выбрасывается за борт для того, чтобы уменьшить вес судна и снять его с мели. В такой ситуации те, кто получает выгоду от жертвы, должны выплатить компенсацию тем, кто несет убытки из-за жертвы, на пропорциональной основе. Так что если приносится в жертву груз или часть судна, грузоотправитель обязан компенсировать грузоотправителю убытки, понесенные во время рейса в подобных чрезвычайных обстоятельствах. Следует отметить, что существует неформальное международное соглашение по этому вопросу. И это Йоркско-Антверпенские правила, впервые разработанные в конце XIX века. Их последний вариант был принят в 1994 году. Они включаются в коносаменты и договоры фрахтования и определяют правила общей аварии. Еще одна обязанность грузоотправителя – оплата фрахта. Обычно оплата происходит при погрузке. Но иногда это может быть freight collect, когда фрахт оплачивает грузополучатель. Если фрахт не оплачен, тогда перевозчик имеет право наложения ареста на имущество для реализации своего права на получение оплаты. Вы встречались с правом наложения ареста на имущество, когда говорили о продаже товаров в первой части курса. В данном случае грузоперевозчик имеет право удерживать товары до того, как не будет произведена оплата. 
товары являются обеспечением этого платежа. Парламент фактически предоставил грузоперевозчику законное право продажи товаров через некоторое время. Так что в соответствии с законом о перевозке товаров 1894 года, часть 7, в случае, если товары не забрали в оговоренный срок или в течение 72 часов, грузоперевозчик имеет право продать эти товары для компенсации стоимости фрахта в течение 90 дней со дня выгрузки или ранее, если товары являются скоро портящимися. Он также имеет право разгрузить товары и поместить их на склад на суше, и он имеет право наложить арест на имущество для оплаты расходов по хранению. И это может быть реализовано таким же образом, с помощью закона о продаже товаров в соответствии с законом о перевозке товаров 1894 года. На этом я заканчиваю лекции о перевозке товаров по морю. В нашей последней лекции мы поговорим о финансировании международной торговли, в частности, о системе документарных аккредитивов. Are also sometimes known as bankers' commercial credits. Those two terms are in fact synonymous; they don't mean anything different. But we should be using the term documentary credits in this course. Now, another preliminary point to make is that when we are talking about documentary credits, as the name would suggest, really they are being used to finance documentary sales. So you should have in your mind. That the underlying sale contract, that really is underlying the documentary credit, should be assumed to be a CIF contract. So the CIF contract, which we examined in detail in the first lecture, is the one that will be the provide the underlying sale contract for the documentary credit system involving the banks. Now, as with the sale of goods itself proper. The system of documentary credits has undergone a certain amount of international codification. Again, it is the International Chamber of Commerce, which produces the INCO terms, of course, which has been instrumental in this. The International Chamber of Commerce provide a codification known as the Uniform Customs and Practice on the documentary credits. Now, the uh, latest edition of which dates from. 1993 and is known under the code name of the UCP 500. So the UCP UCP 500 is a very important codification here, very commonly used in practice. Although, again, as with the INCO terms, it has no binding force of law. That means that when parties open a documentary credit, invariable. Invariably, it will be expressed to be governed by the provisions of the UCP 500. An interesting question is what would happen if a documentary credit did not refer to the UCP 500? Well, you may recall that under English law, it is possible for terms to be implied into contracts by trade usage. So when there is a contract relating to a particular trade, then the terms of the contract will, in the absence of express terms to the contrary, be presumed to include those, those terms which are customary in that trade. Now, it's arguable that that would apply in the field of documentary credits, and that even a documentary credit which failed to 
expressly say that it incorporated the UCP 500 would nonetheless be subject to its terms so much as they were consistent. Because the UCP 500 represents um, a codification of the international bankers' custom. Now, the um, ICC, when it periodically revises the UCP, expressly takes into account changes in banking and mercantile practice so as to keep the rules up to date with the actual practice of those people who are engaged in the financing of international trade. So the UCP 500 can be taken as an authoritative codification and is very important in practice. So the UCP very detailed code on documentary credits. I shall not go into all of the details of it. My aim here is simply to introduce to you the principles lying underneath the system of documentary credits. Well, first of all then, who are the parties to a documentary credit? Well, for a start, we have the buyer and the seller in the underlying sales contract. That is obvious enough. And it is for the buyer, that is to say the person who has the payment obligation, to arrange to open the documentary credit. You could note, however, that there is no inherent right of a seller to demand payment by documentary credit. This is not an ordinary implied incident of an international contract, be it CIF contract or otherwise. Therefore, if the seller wants the protection of a documentary credit, then he must stipulate for that in the sales contract. Well, a good reason why that a documentary credit is not required as a standard incident of an international contract is, as will be seen, it is a rather expensive system of payment in the sense that it involves several parties. In fact, two banks will be involved in every documentary credit. So, if a documentary credit is not in fact necessary in the circumstances of a particular transaction, then it's likely that the party will in fact not go to the expense of opening a documentary credit. There are much more direct payment systems. Well, simply the buyer sends payment to the seller and providing they are known to each other, perhaps they have done business before, there is no reason to involve banks with the additional fees and charges that that will bring. Well, let's consider the parties to a documentary credit. Well, in every case, two banks will be involved, as I have mentioned already. The buyer, whose duty it is, of course, to open the documentary credit, will liaise with the first bank, known as the issuing bank. The issuing bank will invariably be in the buyer's own country, and, as likely as not, indeed, the buyer's own bank. That will be the most convenient method for him. So the buyer arranges with the issuing bank to open the documentary credit. Now, the issuing bank will engage an advising bank, and this advising bank will in fact be in the seller's country of business. So the two banks in the basic documentary credit situation are the issuing bank in the buyer's country and the advising bank in the seller's country. Now, the reason for having these two banks seems clear enough. It's much easier for the buyer to do business with the bank in his country. Likewise, the advising bank being in the seller's country is convenient for him. What then are the stages of the documentary credit? Well, the credit itself essentially is a mechanism whereby payment is received against documents. So this idea that we discussed in an earlier lecture that in fact a CIF contract is indeed a sale of documents and not a sale of goods at all. Certainly from the point of view of the payment arrangements and a documentary credit, there is a good deal to be said for that view. In a documentary credit, the basic idea is that payment 
is received for tender of documents. The flow of the documents will be that the seller, once he has shipped the goods, will forward the documents to the advising bank, that is to say the bank in his own country, which will have advised him that a credit in his favour has been opened. Providing there is a valid tender of those documents, the advising bank will pay to the seller the sum due under the contract, or to be more exact, the sum due under the credit, which will have been opened in his favour. Then the advising bank will forward those same documents to the issuing bank, and the issuing bank will give the money to the advising bank, and then finally the buyer himself will receive the documents from the issuing bank, providing that he, again, pays the issuing bank the outstanding sum in his account. So at each stage there is the essential movement which is documents being tendered and payment being given in exchange for it. Well, why then does that make the system so secure? Well, the idea here lies in the fact that the documents represent the goods themselves and also in the case of the CIF contract rights against the carrier, because there will be a bill of lading which embodies the contract of carriage, and also rights against insurers, because an insurance policy will be one of the documents that is always required. Now what that means is that should a party further down the line become insolvent, the party immediately before it will in fact not be left in a situation of not being able to claim its money, because what it can do is realise the security of the goods in the underlying transaction by using the documents to gain control of them. Well, as an example, let us imagine that the buyer becomes insolvent and is therefore unable to pay the issuing bank the outstanding sum for the letter of credit. Well, in such a situation, the issuing bank will not be left empty-handed because it will have to hand the shipping documents, so the invoice, the bill of lading and the insurance policy. And simply what it will be able to do is to sell those documents, representing of course the goods shipped, and therefore to realise its security in that way. So documentary credit is a particularly secure method of payment. Now, from the seller's point of view, the advantage of the documentary credit is that it enables him to deal with a creditworthy source in his own country. A bank, of course, or at least in any ordinary situation, is going to be highly creditworthy institution, and therefore the seller will not be too concerned that the bank will go insolvent. But also, of course, the seller can retain title to the documents until he has actually been paid. So the seller need never fear because the um, bank will be under a duty to pay him and if it does not do so he can reclaim or retract his tender of the documents. Equally of course the fact that the advising bank is in the seller's own country as that will be the normal position provides definite practical and logistical advantages for him. It's easier simply to deal with um, a bank or other institution in one's own country. Whereas on the other hand the buyer may well be in a foreign country on the other side of the world and communication certainly of a direct nature may be rather difficult. So the basic stages of the documentary credit seems doc see documents moving along the line from the seller through the hands of the banks until they get to the buyer. And equally, at each stage, there is a reverse movement of money, payment for the sales contract, moving via the banks from the buyer to the seller. So that's the basic idea of a documentary credit. It's a simply somewhat complicated payment arrangement, complicated because of the need for security and hence the involvement of the banks. Now, the uh, 
credit that I have described so far is what might be called an unconfirmed credit. In an unconfirmed credit, there is only one bank which has an obligation to pay the seller, and that's the issuing bank. The issuing bank, when it opens the letter of credit, comes into a contractual arrangement with the seller, the terms of that contract being that the seller will receive payment from the issuing bank on a correct tender of the documents. Now, the advising bank, in an unconfirmed credit, is simply acting as agent of the issuing bank. Now, an agent is someone who acts on behalf of his principal. That means that he is able to bind his principal to a contract. An agent normally has power to contract on the part of his principal. But even though it might appear to the observer that the agent was making the contract, in fact, the contract will be made with the principal. So, although the seller might appear to be dealing with the 